So we're gonna move on to House File 2230, which is the Health and Human Service Omnibus. Remember, this is our last budget bill to assemble in the Health and Human Service Omnibus, which will include three different budget proposals. We have Chair Schultz, who is the Health and Human Service Bill, House File 2127. We have Chair Leveling's uh, Health Bill, House File 2128, in Articles 1, 2, 3, and 6 of Chair Pinto's Early Childhood um, Budget Bill, which is House File 2230, which we heard yesterday. Chair Schultz, so, 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 I can't say your name, Jen. Chair Schultz and Chair Liebling have assembled their bills under a combined budget target. So this omnibus will use Chair Liebling House File 2128 as the vehicle. At the request of nonpartisan staff, we are using a delete all amendment that merges these bills to ensure the appropriation articles is correctly draft. The DE2 amendment to House File 2128 that was provided to members reflects the language of all three bills as they came out of their committee, along with any technical corrections made by nonpartisan staff. We do also have a combined spreadsheet from Mr. Burge who were where the provisions are color coded by committee. We will proceed directly to House File 2128 and let all three of our chairs discuss their portions of the bill once the amendment is before us. So Chair Liebling, I'm going to let you direct the presentation, but first, um, would you like to move House File 2128 as well as the DE2 amendment? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to move House File 2128 uh, to be recommended to be re-referred to uh, the floor. And then I would like to move the DE2 amendment. All right, so you can start off um, with your presentation. All right, well, thank you very much, Madam Chair. We also have an author's amendment, the A15. And I think that um, because the A15 um, actually eliminates some provisions that uh, members might like to know about. And um, it, it does a lot of things, but could I move that right you now? Move that now? Chair? Yes. All right, so move, yeah. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, members, as with all omnibus bills, there are a number of things that are um, corrected and uh, in the author's amendment, and it's uh, uh, got a lot of pages to it, but, um, I just want to kind of give you the highlights of the author's amendment um, before we go into more of the detail on the bill. So, and I'm going to just talk about the pieces in the author's amendment that pertain to my sections, and then Representative Schultz, Chair Schultz, will talk about the ones that pertain to her. And I, there, I don't know if there are things that pertain to Chair Pinto. He may want to discuss that as well. First of all, the very first thing in the author's amendment is um, some uh, language that um, aligns us with the Senate with regard to um, dispensing fees for prescription drugs under medical assistance. Uh, Representative Grunhagen in our committee was quite adamant. He wanted to uh, raise the rate even further than it is in our original bill. And so we are accommodating that and aligning with the Senate. Secondly, I wanted to point this out to members. We've removed a provision that took savings from a change in the way we pay for durable medical equipment. I just want to point that out because I know that provision was causing a lot of heartburn for certain folks. That will now be out of the bill. Um, there's a provision from House File 57 that had been heard in our committee that had been left out because we um, had a cost, but was worked out to not have a cost. Um, so that is in the bill. Um, there are some technical changes. There is um, under the prescription drug article, article five, um, we have removed CGIP from a provision in the bill because we realized that um, the bill, this has to do with uh, prescription drug formulary transparency. 
And we came to realize that because CGIP, which for people watching might not know that acronym, that's our um, public employee um, health insurance system um, for Minnesota, and that, um, that the provisions really don't apply to CGIP anyway, because it's managed in a different way. Um, by the same token, there's another provision that was a bill from Representative Bonner 2114 that is being deleted here because um, it does unfortunately have a cost. And so we're taking that out of the bill, it has an unexpected cost. Um, telehealth is a pretty important part of this bill. I know a number of people watching are very <laughs> interested in the telehealth provisions. Um, we've done some uh, just technical changes here, but importantly, we, we had intended the sunset in the bill to apply to changes that are being made in private plans as well as our public programs. So we are reflecting that in the amendment. Um, and I'll talk about that in a moment when I run through the actual bill. Uh, but that covers, oh, and then there are some changes in the appropriations that impact my part of the bill as well. And that is, um, we are uh, in the bill, we are providing additional funding uh, for our public health infrastructure, something we're very proud of. Uh, we're putting rider language to make sure that that money is to supplement and not supplant local funds for public health. And um, we are also increasing uh, because we um, moved some money around a little bit as we got uh, fiscal notes and got more specific um, fiscal estimates we're able to put some additional money into the public health response contingency account. So I will turn it over to Representative Schultz to talk about her portions just of this author's amendment, the A-15. Uh, to Chair Schultz. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair Moran and Chair Liebling. So in the um, author's amendment, there are four provisions under human services. The first is just a correction to a drafting mistake in the revisor's office relating to House File 1943, which is Chair Pinto's bill. The second is language to fix the customized living um, reimbursement rate for um, housing with service facilities. Um, the third is updated language for collective bargaining negotiations over the PCA contracts. And the last one is language to give um, direction to DHS when working on billing corrections with tribes. And those are the, the four um, provisions in the author's amendment under human services. So Madam Chair, I don't know if uh, Chair Pinto uh, had anything okay. in this that he would want to mention. Okay, um, Chair and, Pinto. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I don't believe that there is anything in this amendment that relates to the early childhood uh, area. Okay, so uh, Chair Liebman, is that your complete overview of the DE2 amendment? It is, Madam Chair. Okay, so uh, Madam Chair, the, the A15 amendment. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So, so oh, what we you. need, so what we need to do now is um, we need to move the the A15. So uh, and there's a question from Representative Schumacher. Paul, okay. For interrupting. Okay, okay, so, um, and, and I, I don't know, so I'm gonna ask uh, Chair Liebman, did you explain the A15 amendment? Yes, Madam Chair, that's what we, we just did a pretty quick run through, but be happy to take questions on it because there are a number of different things in it. Okay, uh, Representative Schumacher. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Chair Liebling and Chair Schultz for uh, this amendment here. Just a couple of questions. First, uh, Chair Levin, I wanted, I really did want to thank you for uh, deleting sections 49 and 50 from the bill. Um, that piece on page four with the durable medical equipment. I very much appreciate that. I was one who had heartburn on that and um, really am glad to see that um, you were able to find a solution to fix that piece. Um, I did have a question on the, the CGA portion of it. Um, you said that the provisions really didn't apply um, because they're not managed in the same way. I know that the the bill that this was taken from um, had a much bigger discussion on that in the state government committee. And since I'm not on the state government committee, I don't really understand. Could you help me understand that piece of it and how it's not managed the same way? Chair Liebling. 
Yeah, I will. Thank you, Representative Schumacher. So, um, first of all, there are two different bills that we uh, need to make sure we're clear. So there is a bill from Representative Bonner that had to do with um, trying to um, control what consumers had to pay for a pharmaceutical at the point of sale. And it referred to the net price of the drug. And this is one that turned out it had a lot of cost. And we're just taking that provision out of the bill. So that would have impacted CGIP as well, but we're just taking it out, period. So um, the one that I was discussing that we took out the portion from um, for CGIP was an Elkins bill. And this has to do with mid-year formulary changes. And the reason that we took out CGIP is what we believe that CGIP, uh, well, first of all, we clarified and found out that when people um, get a CGIP plan, when an employee gets this um, employer plan, which is what CGIP is, that you don't pick your plan based on the formulary. Everybody has the same formulary. So that's fundamentally different than what happens in the private market where you go and shop for a plan. And the problem that this bill is trying to solve in this area is the problem of some consumers will choose their plan based on what drugs are covered in the formulary. And that consumer buys a plan, say they buy it on Minsure or they buy it through a broker, they are locked into that plan for a year. But the insurance company can change the formulary at any time. And so oftentimes you'll have a consumer who's getting a certain drug and suddenly that drug is no longer covered or covered at a different cost for them. And so there's um, a fundamental unfairness there where a person is buying a plan and expecting to get a certain thing and they're picking the plan for that reason. And then they're locked in, but the insurance company is not. That is fundamentally different than what's going on in CGIP where everybody's getting the same plan. You are not picking a plan based on your need for a certain drug. Everyone who's in CGIP is in the same boat. So that's why um, we felt that it is a principal distinction to say that we're not going to cover CGIP with this requirement because consumers are not being deprived of the benefit of their bargain under CGIP, but they are in the private market. Mm -hmm. I hope that helps Representative Schumacher. Representative Schumacher. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Representative Weebling. Yes, that does uh, make more sense uh, after you've explained it that way. Um, that did uh, seem to work out. So uh, with that, you have the, the bill in there. There, When the bill was originally in front of us in committee before, and this language um, was in there with the, without CGIP being excluded, is that where the, the cost on the fiscal notes for the, the Elkins bill um, were those part of the budget then originally? And if so, does getting rid of the CGIP uh, piece of that, does that open up funds? Or how did that work? Um, Chair, Chair Liebling. Madam Chair and Representative Schumacher, no, I think we didn't have the bill. We just didn't include the bill at that time because it did carry a lot of cost and we were trying to figure out how to do that. And so we're putting that piece back in the, without CGIP is what's happening in this amendment. So that piece, which, as you might recall, is really important. The uh, Minnesota Medical Association was particularly interested in this piece. And initially, we weren't, uh, we weren't able to do it. And we're, oh, no, I'm sorry. Wait a minute. I might be mixing that up with a different provision. Um, in any event, we did not, um, we never did include those costs in our bill. And I think we just left it out, as I said and that this is what is going back in now. Okay. And if staff will correct me if I got that backwards, hopefully. Okay, Representative Schumacher. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, Chair Liebling, for that understanding. I appreciate that. Uh, my last question for this amendment is for Chair Schultz. Um, and it deals with the portion that's on page nine, uh, lines 929 through 9.31. I'm um, just wondering where that date came from for the integrated community supports for that deadline for next year. Chair Schultz. I'm sorry, can you repeat your question, Representative Schumacher?
Yes, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair. Chair. Schultz, please go forth. Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, Chair Schultz, uh, on page nine, uh, lines 9.29 through 9.31, this is the um, integrated health sections. Um, just wondering on the deadline for that, the April 1st, 2021, that's on our screen now. Um, how did that come to and uh, what impact do we expect to have from the, the integrated services? Representative Schultz. Thank you, Chair Moran and uh, Representative Schumacher. So this is language we've been working on to make sure that certain housing with services does not need to apply for assisted living licensure and they can continue customized living. So this is language that allows them to continue customized living. Now DHS is moving forward with something called integrated community supports to make sure that we're following federal guidelines. Um, so under they're moving towards this new system. So this is why they put a date for new facilities um, going forward to um, um, capture providers under this new system. Representative Schumacher. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Chair Schultz, for that. Um, I have talked to uh, Touchstone Mental Health and Clear Housing, two of the organizations that provide uh, care for homeless folks that also have HIV or other disabilities with this, and they have some concerns with that uh, April 1st deadline there. Is that something that can continue to be worked on for that, or is that kind of a hard and fast deadline that you're proposing here? Representative Schultz. Chair Schultz. Thank you, Chair Moran and Representative Schumacher. We continue to work with um, Claire and Touchstone to um, listen to their concerns. Uh, this is an amendment that we initially created um, in my committee on the last Friday of our committee hearings. And we're, we continue to work with DHS and the providers on language. So I, I think that moving forward, we're gonna continue to work with providers um, and try to accommodate their concerns when it moves to conference committee or the floor. Representative Schumacher. Okay, that concludes my questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, thank you. Is there any other questions or comments to the A15 amendment? If not, Chair Liebling's renew her motion to adopt the A15 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. Okay. Um, is there any, well, we have another amendment. We have the A16 amendment that I believe Representative Schultz is um, moving. Uh, Representative, I'm sorry, Chair Schultz, would you like to move the A16 amendment? I would like to move the A16 amendment, Chair Moran. Can you please explain it? Thank you, Chair Moran. The A16 amendment um, provides language to address um, uh, mistake in the human services omnibus bill um, to correct language to make sure it aligns with our spreadsheet and it's around the, the PCA framework language. Okay. Is there any questions to the A16 amendment? All right. There being none, um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. Okay, so there, are there any further questions to the DE2 amendment as amended? Madam Chair? Yes, Chair Liebling. All right, Madam Chair, I know we, we spent uh, some time on the uh, author's amendment, but we haven't really described the bill yet. And so okay. I, I wonder if we could just, uh, this is, um, especially with the three bills together, this is a very large bill and uh, in my, uh, unbiased opinion here, it's really a terrific bill. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to um, actually, you uh, explained in your introduction that uh, about combining these three bills. Mm -hmm. And so I'd like to ask uh, Chair Schultz to go first to describe her portions of the bill. And then I'd like to just very uh, briefly in kind of a summary way talk about what is in the bill because there, there are uh, many really wonderful provisions and we just, uh, I know I know time is short, but we'd love to have just a few minutes to run through it. You have time, Chair Schultz. 
Thank you, Chair Moran, and thank you, Chair Liebling. So this is one of the best health and human services omnibus finance bills I've seen in my time in the legislature. Okay. Um, we have a joint budget target of $346.5 million and a tails target of $299.2 million. That does, does not include uh, Chair Pinto's provisions in early childhood. So this is just the health and the human services uh, jurisdiction. Um, I also want to thank all of the staff that have been working so hard on these uh, big, big bills. Um, and I won't name everybody here, but I want to thank our staff and nonpartisan staff and fiscal staff. So if, Chris, if uh, Mr. McCall could share a document that will help um, me, I am just going to highlight a few of the budget provisions in the human services uh, omnibus. And I'm not going to talk about every single thing. We'll be here all night if I did. I wish I could. Mm -hmm. But I broke it down into six sections. One is I have, there's two divisions reporting to human services. One is preventing homelessness chaired by Chair Gomez. And the second is behavioral health chaired by uh, Representative Fisher. And so these six uh, areas, I broke the down, down, them down into one is preventing homelessness. The second is economic assistance. The third is caregiving or home and community-based services, HCBS. The fourth is behavioral health. The next one is substance abuse reforms or SUD, substance use disorder reforms. Um, and the last category is child welfare and protections. So the first piece, and then I've got listed just the biennium budget and not the tails. But all of this information is in the budget tracking sheet that Doug Berg has um, been working on. So in the first uh, part of preventing homelessness, we're dedicating $25 million, And this is based on representatives Hassan, Howard, and Cagle's bills. Um, 5 million goes for emergency shelters, 18 million for emergency service grants, and 2 million in housing and support service grants. The bill also includes language for reports regarding projects funded under the Long-Term Homelessness Supportive Services Program. The second area under preventing homelessness are, is House File 780. This is Representative Ryer's bill. It expands um, beds that um, serve individuals who are experiencing uh, mental health or substance abuse or HIV AIDS. And this expands from the counties currently being offered these beds, which I think are there's 226 beds currently. This expands to 500 beds. Currently in Noka, Dakota, Hennepin and Ramsey County, this bill includes additional counties of Carver, Scott and Washington counties. The second area is economic assistance. And the first uh, bill of note is the cost of living adjustment for the Minnesota Family Investment Program. This program um, helps low-income families get out of deep poverty. And deep poverty for a family of three is only $905 a month. The current MFIP cash benefit is $632 for a family of three, meaning this benefit level is below deep poverty. We've only increased MFIP once in the last 35 years. That happened in 2019. So this bill includes a COLA adjustment and it uses the consumer price index. Also in 2021, there's a one-time MFIP increase of $700 and that's a $25 million expense. The second provision under economic assistance is the economic assistance program uniformity provision. And this reduces the administrative burden on the applicants, participants, and on counties. So for example, MFIP costs about $128 per case per month to administer. This um, replaces uh, monthly reporting to six month reporting and reduces uh, paperwork burden. The third provision under economic assistance is the SNAP. This is Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. It increases the federal poverty guidelines from 165% to 200%. And this follows along. Um, many other states have also increased the, this provision. And the cost is very small because most of it's covered by federal funds. The next category is caregiving and home and community-based services. This is the uh, personal care attendant increase. One is in the SEIU contract. This increases wages from 1325 to 1440, starting October 2021. And then um, the wage floor from 1440 to 1525, starting in July 2022. There's also a rate framework increase. This is Representative Lippard's bill, House File 663. This um, increases uh, rates and it has a cost of 8.3 million in the biennium and um, close to 40 million in the tails. 
But as you, as most people know, we've been working on PCA rate reform for a long time. We see um, a huge shortage of PCAs across the state. Um, and so we're trying to address that workforce shortage and the historically low wages um, for PCAs. And they do very important work, particularly we see this during the pandemic. So we have more work to do in this area, but this is a, a good beginning. Um, under the PCAs, we're also uh, funding Representative Acom's bill, House File 1159. This extends um, um, reimbursement for spouses and parents to provide PCA services. And this expired um, in early February, and this extends that until um, the new rate framework is initiated. Uh, the last piece under caregiving and home and community-based services is the waiver reimagine. Uh, waivers, these waivers help to help people with disabilities remain active in their communities and also to be to stay healthy and safe and independent as much as possible. So this simplifies um, um, the waiver system and it reduces inconsistent inconsistencies across counties. The next category under is under behavioral health. Chair Fisher, uh, along with um, Representative Frankie and in a bipartisan way with all of their committee members worked to address um, many issues. They heard House File 970 under mental health. This is Representative Vang's bill. And what this bill does is to um, address the workforce shortage in mental health by making alcohol and drug counselors eligible for an existing loan forgiveness program. Um, allowing DHS children's mental health grants to be used to provide supervision to clinical trainees from BIPOC communities, establishing a culturally informed and responsive mental health task force, and increasing diversity on licensing boards. The next bill under behavioral health is um, funding um, to add to the adult mental health initiative grants. This was being led by Representative Ryer and House File 1600. And last under behavioral health is the mental health uniform service standards, trying to standardize um, um, paperwork and making it easier for mental health, um, uh, mental health professionals to do a, their job and provide high quality care. Under um, substance abuse reforms, this is a lot of significant work was done by Chair Fisher and his division um, to reform substance abuse and improve outcomes and quality. The first one um, was funding recovery community organization grants. This was Representative Jordan, House File 2084. These organizations provide mentorship and ongoing support to individuals dealing with substance abuse disorders and connecting them with resources. The second one is a provision brought forward by Representative Thompson, House File 722. Um, this includes a 5% rate increase for substance abuse disorder treatment services provided by culturally specific or culturally responsive programs or disability responsive programs. Um, a rate increase um, also directs DHS in cons consultation with SUD, tre SUD treatment providers, lead agencies and individuals who receive treatment to develop a statewide implementation and transition plan for culturally and linguistically appropriate services. Um, that, have na that are national standards. And also this item includes spending uh, for grants to said treatment providers to implement culturally and linguistically appropriate service standards. The SUD paperwork um, initiative, um, this is brought forward by Representative Frederick, House File 2116, to minimize regulatory paperwork for SUD providers. And then Chair Fisher, the SUD reform uh, initiative was to um, improve enhanced rates to SUD uh, treatment programs to get more programs enrolled in a demonstration project and to improve outcomes and quality. And lastly, under this uh, category is uh, Edelson, Representative Edelson, Edelson's bill, House File 287. This is the Sober Home Oversight Study. Um, this is a study of looking at the functioning and outcomes for sober homes across the state. The next area is under child welfare and protections. Uh, House file 944 was worked on by Representative Hansen. Uh, this is a significant and very important legislation. Um, currently, if um, individuals or families who are on medical assistance, if their children need intensive mental health services, 
Many would have to go into the child protection system to take advantage of title, federal Title IV-E dollars. This corrects that problem to keep children out of the child protective system and allows them to get those mental health services without having to go into that child protective system. The second one is the family first implementation provision. Representative Knorr worked on this language. It was also in the governor's budget. It allows states to leverage federal funding to provide services to families for children who are at risk of out-of-home placement, so to reduce out-of-home placement and keep children and their families in a safe environment in a safe way. The next provision is Chair Pinto's House File 1943. This creates the new child protection non-caregiver sex trafficking assessment track. Um, there's also a provision by Chair Pinto in House File 947, Section 6, and that raises the age of delinquency from 10 to 13. The next one is House File 390. This is Chair Becker Finn's parent support grants. It appropriates funding for grants to an organization to provide mentoring, guidance, and support services to parents navigating the child welfare system in Minnesota. The next one is from the governor's budget. The governor's proposal invests in the Indian Child Welfare Act, ICWA, and the Minnesota Indian Family Preservation Act, training and development for county child welfare and child protective staff. Um, and the, I'm sorry, and the parent support grants, I believe uh, Chair Moran also worked on that provision. Um, the next one under, um, uh, the miscellaneous category are the repayments to the tribal and county repayments for overpayments under um, um, IMDs. Um, the next miscellaneous item uh, is funding for the essential workers, the Emergency Leave Act, which was uh, Representative Frazier's bill, House File 41. This covers uh, uh, staff in employed in nursing facilities. And the last one are making some COVID changes permanent. And this was sponsored by Representative Wolgamott. So that is just a summary of the budget bills. I am not going to go through all of the policy provisions, but I encourage you to look through the omnibus bill and would stand for questions after um, the summary of the rest of the bill. Okay, uh, Chair Leadley. Um, all right. Thank you, Madam Chair. And so um, I'll, uh, I don't have a, a visual aid today, but uh, just we'll talk through um, in pretty general terms some of the provisions in the health portion of the bill. Um, and, uh, and I will say too that at the end of this um, and after Chair Pinto gets done, I know that our fiscal staff, uh, Mr. Berg, has prepared sort of a summary sheet. Um, we're not going to ask him to walk through the spreadsheet um, as some of the other bills have done because we'd probably be here till tomorrow. It's a, I think it's a 26 page spreadsheet in the tiny little type in which these things are done. So we don't want him to walk through, but I think what he, we will do is put up his summary sheet and, and, and uh, perhaps ask him to explain that. But so the health portion of, uh, of the bill um, does a number of very important things. The first thing is it really works to build a better healthcare system and in particular, a better public health system which uh, the COVID pandemic has really shown a spotlight on the holes in our public health uh, safety net. And so first of all, we have in the bill um, a provision from Representative Kelly Morrison and Representative Jay Zhang, House File 2113, that is about vaccine equity. And um, we've, we've um, also put some money in that bill so that it's not only about now, it's about building a better system to reach underserved populations in the future as well. And we've put $10 million uh, for the biennium, per biennium, excuse me, into that. Uh, because uh, as I said, it's very important that we now, we now understand the importance of public health to our state and to its whole economy. Um, we also are uh, building that public health infrastructure through some investments in local public health um, also $10 million a biennium. This is a Wolgamont bill. And we're putting some money into refreshing the public health contingency account, which has been depleted in the pandemic. Um, probably we'll need to do more with that um, in coming years, but we, we've taken a start on that. Um, there are a number of provisions um, 
that are kind of the off-ramp for waivers that have been put in place by the Department of Human Services uh, during the pandemic that we're funding. Um, we also have some studies in the bill to think about how we deliver public health programs in the future and how to establish a public health insurance option that will make health insurance more affordable over the long term, and that is a Schultz bill. Um, we are putting Affordable Care Act provisions into state statute to make sure that they don't go away. Um, important things that uh, everybody has come to really rely on, such as not losing your, uh, not being charged higher rates when you have pre existing conditions or not being denied insurance. So those things uh, would go into Minnesota law in this bill. And finally, uh, under this category, Representative Morrison worked hard on telehealth. I mentioned this a little bit during our discussion of the, um, of the amendment, of the author's amendment, but um, what we're doing on telehealth, um, there's been a lot of interest in continuing the expansion that happened during the pandemic. So as many of you know, during the pandemic, um, people have been able to have a lot more visits over um, audiovisual, like we're doing right now over Zoom or even over the phone. And it's been uh, a very important experiment, if you will. But it turns out that keeping this as wide open as we have it is also very expensive, or at least the fiscal note is high. So we're taking sort of a middle ground approach. We are kind of keeping a lot of these provisions in law. Uh, with a sunset and with a study that will come back and tell us, kind of uh, allow us to look at this a little more fine tune in two years in the next budget cycle. So that is what is going on with telehealth in this bill. Um, other than that, there's a lot in this bill that improves health and well being for kids and their families and addresses health disparities. Um, importantly, we are expanding postpartum coverage for, for people who give birth on medical assistance from 60 days to six months. Uh, we would have liked to go for a year, um, but the cost was prohibitive on that. But we do understand that this is very important to the health and well-being of new moms to have this continued coverage. We are covering um, under medical assistance right now. Um, a lot of different things are covered. A lot of medications are covered. But medical assistance right now excludes coverage for weight loss drugs. This is a Connie Bernardi, Representative Bernardi provision. And it turns out that this is a real gap in our coverage. Um, and it often impacts teenagers and it often impacts teenagers of color. And being obese is a really uh, has a lot of very bad impacts on a person's overall health. And there are now drugs that can be very useful in this effort. So that is being covered under this bill. Better asthma management for kids with very bad asthma. Again, uh, often these are kids of color. This is a, a very important improvement for health. Um, expanding integrated perinatal care for high risk women, another equity provision because we know we have terrible disparities in the health of new moms and their babies. Um, we have uh, Representative Richardson's Dignity and in Pregnancy and Childbirth Bill, which is one of the, another, I should say, uh, recommendation from the Select Committee on Racial Justice. We have increased funding for lead risk assessments, which is coming from Representative Lee. Uh, we fix the family foster background studies to align with adoption standards. This was Representative Moran's uh, really uh, important bill that she carried in the past. Representative Hollins is carrying it now. And um, I am just so grateful for that because I think this will make such a difference for children who are um, unfortunately need to be removed from their homes to make it much more possible for them to stay with their kin when that happens. Um, we have the uh, skin lightening cream bill from uh, Representative Hassan to uh, continue working on this very important public health issue. And we have a small grant for an organization that tries to address gun trauma, which is a very compelling presentation that we heard in our committee about 
the trauma both of people who end up using a gun and those who end up on the receiving end of the gun and how this traumatizes communities. Very timely, I would say. Um, we have provisions in the bill to improve dental care in our public health programs. And I know this is of great interest to many members. We have Representative Bierman's bill to increase or to, to continue covering, to once again cover periodontal care. This was uh, carved out to save money some years ago when we had a budget deficit. And it it is just uh, not covering that service means that people really don't get the care that they really need to keep themselves healthy, to keep them healthy. Um, we have uh, a plan that Representative Ryer has been working on also from the governor's budget that's a little bit still in progress, but we're getting much closer. And that is to have a single dental administrator for all our public programs, have a dental home concept to actually improve dental coverage, dental care for people on medical assistance, and also to provide higher rates for dentists who see our public program patients. And I know members, many members on both sides of the aisle have wanted to do this for years. We are finally able to do that in this bill. We've got maybe a couple tweaks that are still being worked out just on the finances, but it is within the appropriation that is in the bill. And finally, on that piece, I mentioned that the uh, durable medical equipment savings have been removed in the author's amendment. Um, and I know Representative Schumacher mentioned he's happy to see that be out. Um, we have a number of provisions on prescription drugs, which we know continues to be a very important issue for Minnesotans who struggle often to be able to afford essential drugs that they need to stay healthy, sometimes to save their very lives. And um, so we have the, a bill in here from Representative Stevenson that prohibits prescription drug price gouging. We have um, a bill that continues the coverage for contraceptives that we now have under the Affordable Care Act, but puts that into Minnesota law and uh, improves coverage for contraceptives for Minnesota women, almost all of whom use contraceptives at some point in their lives. We are eliminating co-pays for HIV drugs in, in this bill. Um, there were more provisions that were brought to us that we unfortunately weren't able to do in the HIV space, but eliminating co-pays is a very important measure that will help reduce the incidence of HIV in our state. Um, very important public health measure. Um, we extend uh, under public programs. We allow certain drugs to be refilled for 90 days instead of only 30, and this is a cost saver. Um, we have a very important provision that I have carried um, and has been in the governor's uh, bill also about getting the, um, getting the PBMs out of our public health care programs. And um, there's been some uh, work done on that to. Uh, you know, try to reduce some of the opposition from some um, entities that feel that they'll be losing some hidden, what I would call hidden subsidies that they've been getting through our Medicaid program um, that they would lose in this. And so we're keeping them whole with some additional funding in the bill. Um, as I mentioned, we are increasing reimbursement to dent to a pharmacist mm -hmm. who um, under our bill who are, uh, and this is a provision, Representative Grunhagen talked about this in our committee, um, an attempt to try to help independent pharmacists. We recognize that many are struggling around the state and we want to try to um, help them stay afloat as much as we can. Oftentimes they provide a lot of the healthcare in a small community. Um, as I mentioned also with the authors of the A12 amendment, we're prohibiting insurance plans from making mid-year formulary changes. And um, we are also including an important bill from Representative Bierman, House File 633, that requires insurance carriers to offer some plans with flat dollar co-pays for drugs. And this is for folks who have chronic conditions who know they're going to have to pay a lot for drugs. And it just simply means they won't have to pay it all out of pocket in the very first month of the year to meet their out of pocket cap or um, to meet their deductible. 
Um, finally, um, and of course, there's much more in there. I know it gets, this is, takes a long time even to just list these items, but um, there are more in there and I hope members will, will read the bill and, uh, and see all the great things that are in there. I just want to mention one other category and that is um, we have funding in the bill or um, changing the funding, I should say, for Hennepin County um, uh, Hospital to um, be able to take advantage of a new funding stream under uh, federal federal money coming in, and uh, they very much need this to uh, stay afloat, and that's a provision that I'm carrying. We do have an exception to the hospital bed moratorium for Regents Hospital to allow them to add 45 new beds, um, including uh, 20 mental health beds. And we have some important improvements to the bed moratorium law that come from Representative Fisher and Representative Lippert. And I won't go into detail on that, except to say that I believe that this will help us um, have more mental health inpatient beds available because we do need them in this state. So um, thank you, Madam Chair. That is a lot. I feel like I've been talking for a very long time and I've just totally skimmed the surface here, but it is uh, really a good bill. We're very proud of it. I do, uh, I'm gonna ask Mr. Berg, well, I think that probably Chair, Chair um, Pinto is gonna wanna say a few words, but um, I do just wanna really give my appreciation to all of the members on uh, both committees that uh, we worked on this. Um, I also sat on Representative Schultz's committee and she sat on mine and many of the same members on both committees and um, everyone worked very hard to put this together and especially my appreciation to the staff. This is a big bill. It's been an enormous effort and um, there will be more thank yous on the floor. So I'll just stop right there, Madam Chair. All right, thank you, Chair Liebling. To Chair Pinto, um, is there anything that you would like to um, share with us? Thank you, Madam Chair and members. And I, I had a chance to walk through the full early childhood bill yesterday, so I don't want to belabor um, that uh, today. I'll simply thank Chairs uh, Liebling and Schultz for allowing early childhood along for the ride and note um, what a close uh, connection there is between the contents of, uh, of, of their two bills and the early childhood bill in terms of getting young kids and their families, young kids off to great start supporting their families too. Chair Liebling identified a number of those provisions. Several passed through our committee, some didn't because they connected more to childbirth and pregnancy. Um, but, but a ton of connection there. And then just more broadly recognizing the different ways that, uh, uh, that allowing uh, young Minnesotans to thrive and therefore all of us to do so, tying with the goals of that broader bill. And then I just want to thank um, uh, uh, one person on staff in particular, which is Doug Berg. Uh, his name was just mentioned, but he's done just incredible work supporting all three of these bills from a fiscal perspective. Many more thank yous. We'll save those for the floor as well. But I did want to give a shout out to him. And then, of course, happy to uh, discuss uh, any further questions members may, may have. Of course, we discussed the bill of fairment yesterday, too. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Thank you, Chair Pinto. So, members, is there any further discussion to the bill or questions before we adopt the DE2 amendment? There being no further discussion. Chair Liebling renews her motion to adopt the DE2 amendment as amended. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? No. The, the motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. Okay, is there any further discussion to the bill before we proceed to final passage? Um, Madam Chair, did you want Mr. Berg to walk through any of the 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 little summary spreadsheet that we have. Do you think that would be helpful, Chair Liebling? Or um, leave it to questions if there's no questions. Yeah, maybe we should just leave it to questions, Madam Chair. Okay, final call. <laughs> Representative Schumacher. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm just uh, happy to do the wrap up for our side when whenever we're ready for that. We're ready, Representative Schumacher. All right, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you to the committee chairs who put this bill together. There's obviously a lot of work that goes into uh, these bills, and um, even though we're not going to agree on a lot of it or much of any of it, it's still uh, really good to, to know that there is sincere work that is put into these bills. Um, as I mentioned before in the previous committee, this is one of maybe two times that I can remember that I've seen an increase 
in the EGHS budget uh, that we've been able to work with. And so I, we've kind of gotten used to over the years having to find savings so that we can do new things uh, throughout the budgets as well. Uh, this year, though, we had that positive target. And so um, there was a lot of different opportunities that we could have taken. But even with that positive target, we still have budget reductions that happened in areas like for the foster care families that we have or for the disability child care providers who are doing work remotely. We're still seeing great changes there that's going to reduce what these foster care families and disability care providers are receiving. We're seeing uh, use of one-time dollars that are going to be put into long-term spending. We're seeing that in the CCAP rates for child care providers. We've been asking for years and trying to find a bipartisan way to get CCAP funding passed, but we've always expected it to come with some reforms to the system after the OLA report that came out a few years ago showing the amount of fraud that can be found in there. So we're never able to get to the actual CCAP rate increases. Uh, we get there this time with this bill, but we're doing it with one-time money. and no reforms. And we're seeing uh, inflationary increases that are given to MFIP coming from a block grant that doesn't increase with inflation. And so at some point, the state's going to be on the hook for that inflationary increase without the help of the block grant. And while we're talking about the MFIP reforms that are going on there, this bill offers cash grant recipients relief to the reporting that they have to do on income eligibility because of how cumbersome and confusing it can be. Yet at the same time, that same population under this bill would then have to keep track of a medical insurance plan, a transportation plan, a dental insurance plan, and a pharmacy benefit plan because of the car routes that we see here versus having just something that is comprehensive. And so I see a bit of a, a juxtaposition for the folks who are in the input program that in one area, we're trying to save them uh, effort that can be confusing, but at the same time, taking away some of the coordination of care that they're going to receive. In addition, this bill does spend nearly $150 million more in new money into the admin of the Department of Human Services. It allows the Department of Human Services to spend whatever it seems necessary if the Supreme Court finds the Affordable Care Act unconstitutional. And for those reasons, Madam Chair members, I will be voting no today. Thank you. Okay, um, any further discussion? Um, I'm just gonna open it up for, uh, well, let me just say this first before I pass it back over to the, um, the chairs for any closing comments. Um, and I will make this short, short too, but I do really want to thank uh, the Health and Human Service Chairs for you know for your leadership and for pulling together this complex but really crucial bill you know as a former chair of health and human service i know the breadth of what goes through those committees and uh, and the, the time and energy uh, and information that is put in through those hearings and you're right that you're leaving i'm sure you're only touching just you know a, a little part of what this bill really in, in this uh, omnibus bill really entails but I just, again, just want to thank you both for, for the work that uh, you, Chair Liebling and Chair Schultz have done to bring this bill before us today in ways and means. And with that, I would just like to open it up to maybe Chair Schultz for a closing statement then Chair Liebling. Thank you, Chair Moran. I just want to um, thank you for your past service on human services. I know you understand how much work that committee is and the important work we do. Um, I, we didn't point out, but a lot of the provisions in our bill address many of the recommendations from the Select Committee on Racial Justice. Um, so we're really proud of that work, and there is more work to do, um, and we've just started. So we're looking forward to continuing to do that work. Um, I will also say that um, this is a we did have a positive budget target, and I want to thank Speaker Hortman for giving us. Uh, revenue to spend in these areas. In my area of human services, we tried to allocate money to those who are most in need and most vulnerable in our state, and there's more work to do there. 
And I'm really optimistic that we'll be getting um, federal money, even though it's one time, and we will be able to use um, a lot of the federal funds for human services and public health. And we're looking forward to um, appropriating that money once we have federal guidelines. And again, I just wanna again, thank the, our committee members for all the great bills they brought forward and for the work that they've done and that they're continuing to do um, on their bills and those that are included in the omnibus. And I look forward to working with them next year on more policy language. Mm. Chair Liebling. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I don't know if a Representative Pinto wanted to respond on the issue about supposedly there being no reforms in the um, child care assistance program where we are putting a lot of uh, funding. It, but uh, I see he unmuted himself. So I won't go into that because I think he'll want to, uh, he should probably respond to that one. But I just do want to respond to a couple of things. Um, I didn't address this directly in my remarks, but. Um, Members who've known me for a while know that I really believe that we need to make fundamental changes in how we deliver our public programs. Right now, 75% of the people who are in our public programs, we take up one public program and we have them essentially take, get into an insurance product. Some of them are, go through our county-based uh, system, which seems to work very well. But some of them uh, you have to even choose between uh, an insurance product. They become a patient of, of a, a managed care organization. And that's where we get a lot of confusion. I would argue and have argued for a long time that it's very wasteful. It's very confusing. And for us as policymakers, it's almost impossible to manage. And yet billions of dollars run through that system. So what we're doing in this bill, there are a number of things, and Representative Schumacher referred to them, um, where we are, to, we are starting to take back some of the uh, benefits that are currently delivered in this very confusing way through our managed care organizations, where we can't manage them, and where the costs are not controllable by us, and we oftentimes don't even know what we're paying for what. And so um, there, there are in this bill a, a few items like that. Now, Representative Schumacher just talked about that being confusing for recipients. I don't, this is the first time I've heard that argument. I know that there's a lot of pushback on this, probably a lot of it coming from the managed care organizations themselves who obviously don't want to lose control of this because losing control of this also probably involves losing control of a great deal of the money that comes along with providing these or managing these services. But I think that we can do a much better job in these areas. One is the prescription drug uh, formulary or a program that I've talked about here where the, the growth trend under managed care organizations under this part of our program is much steeper than it is um, for us in, in the um, fee-for-service side where we're delivering it directly. Um, we have um, the dental program where we spend tons of money, but we get very, very poor results. It's time to do something different in that space. We are paying a lot of money and yet people on those programs are not getting the dental care they deserve. We need to make fundamental change there. And then there's another one about how we give people rides to get to the doctor, which also is needs reform. So, you know, I, so I, I'm just going to, I guess, respectfully disagree with Representative Schumacher on that. The other thing that he said that I just would like to push back on briefly is the idea that because we have a target that's a plus target, and we do, this is a very good target for which I thank the speaker, it's a very important time to invest in health and human services. But having a positive target doesn't mean we should not make cuts anywhere. We should always be looking to see where are we overspending? What do we need to tweak? Where are we not getting what we're paying for? So the idea that we shouldn't make cuts anywhere is uh, really surprising to me. Of course we should, we always should be looking to see what's working, what isn't working. And we wanna always be spending money, our resources, everyone here knows, will always be limited. So we need to focus our efforts on where they can do the most good and be willing to pull back on spending in areas where it's not buying what we needed to. So with that, Madam, 
Chair, I thank you again for giving us this time. I would encourage members to vote for this bill. I hope that Representative Pinto will say a couple of words about the child care assistance program, because I think that uh, that criticism that there's no reform on that and that is just completely off base, but that would be more for him to uh, respond to. So thank you, members, and uh, we'll really appreciate your vote for this bill. All right. Um, I, I guess you opened the door, Chair Liebling. Uh, Representative Pinto, Chair Pinto, would you like to make any further ending statements? I, I, I will do, Madam Chair, and I'll do so very quickly. Um, and I will just note that, as Chair Liebling has said, uh, there, uh, the bill is, in fact, chock full of, uh, of reforms in the, in the area of early care and learning and uh, related to child care assistance program. I'm not sure if, uh, if the lead Schumacher, what he's referencing is the idea of the program integrity which was concerned several years ago. And I just want to remind him and everyone that actually we did a ton in the budget bill two years ago um, to address many concerns in that area. And so that's less of a focus in this particular bill. What the focus in this one uh, is very much saying that, uh, that we have a system that is fragmented and, and confusing for providers and for families alike. So doing a lot to, to work on it. And so uh, we have uh, quite a bit, as I highlighted yesterday, in terms of looking at the governance, I'm looking at the parent aware quality metric system and how well that is working. Um, and, uh, and quite a bit of reform. Um, I'm not sure if there's something in particular that uh, Representative Schumacher has in mind, um, but I will note that it probably is in the bill if he does have something. I'm happy to talk with him further. We can be really proud of the, uh, of the proposal and uh, would urge members to vote in support of the, uh, of the bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chairs. <clears throat> there being no further discussion, Chair Liebling renews a motion that House File 2128, as amended, be recommended for placement on the general register and that nonpartisan staff be directed to make any technical corrections. This will be a roll call vote. Ms. Sparkman, please take the roll. Chair Moran. Aye. Moran, aye. Vice Chair Olson. Aye. Olson, aye. Representative Garofalo. Representative Garofalo. Garofalo votes no. Um, Representative Albright excused. Representative Becker Finn. Aye. Becker Finn, aye. Representative Bernardi. Aye. Bernardi, aye. Representative Eklund excused. Representative Hansen. Aye. Hansen, aye. Representative Hassan. Um, Representative aye. Hassan, Hassan, aye. Representative Hertos. Representative Hertos. Representative Hornstein. Representative Hornstein. Representative Johnson. No. Johnson, no. Representative Kresha? No. Kresha, no. Representative Liebling? Aye. Liebling, aye. Representative Lilly? Lilly, aye. Lilly, aye. Representative Mariani? Mariani, aye. Mariani, aye. Representative Marquart? Marquart, aye. Marquart, aye. Representative Miller? Miller, no. Miller, no. Representative Nash? Nash, no. Nash, no. Representative Nelson, excused. Representative Noor? No, aye. Noor, aye. Representative O'Neill? O'Neill, no. O'Neill, no. Representative Pulowski? Pulowski, aye. Pulowski, aye. Representative Petersburg? Petersburg, no. Petersburg, no. Representative Pinto? Aye. Pinto, aye. Representative Schumacher? Schumacher, no. Schumacher, no. Representative Schultz? Schultz, aye. Schultz, aye. Representative Scott? No. Scott, no. Representative Sundin? Aye. Sundin, aye. Representative Hertos? Representative Hornstein? Aye. Hornstein, aye. 16 ayes and nine nays. There have been 16 ayes and nine nays. The motion prevails. 
House File 2128 as amended is recommended for placement on the general register and nonpartisan staff are directed to make any technical corrections. I want to thank you, thank all of our chairs and the various Health and Human Service Committees for their hard work this session.